uh, conference. I hope you all had a great lunch and a uh, good time to catch up with old friends. Uh, we're now going to be starting the second session. Uh, the plenary speaker for this session will be Liran Wu from uh, Baruch College. Have we got him online? Hello, Liran. Hello. Are you, uh, you ready to go? Yes, let me see if I can share. Yes, looks like. So. I can hear you well. Okay. So my sharing is paused. I think I need uh, James to make the sharing work. Uh, James uh, should be online. This could be just a delay with your with your computer updating. No, it says you are screen sharing is paused. For us, it's a started screen sharing. I did. It doesn't uh, allow me. And, uh, see, it's paused. Your screen sharing is paused. And I cannot screen resume. Screen sharing is blocked. <laughs> you saw a screen? Yes. Oh, him, yes, but the slides. He's trying to share the slides. <clears throat> It says that your screen sharing is paused. James, to allow for screen sharing. We'll double check that the uh, function's been enabled. Let me give it a shot. It looks like it allowed me to do the operation, but uh, once I get to the sharing, it says it's paused. Okay, now let me give it a shot again. Yeah, it still says paused. No weird. Maybe doing this will work. Let's see. Is it working? Yeah. Where is it? I cannot see it. It's on which side? We have it. We have it. It's great. It looks great. But this is oh, okay. This is desktop sharing, not the slides sharing. Okay. Let me see. Maybe it's the slides that's having problems. Yeah, very interesting. It doesn't allow me to share the screen. That's fine. So I think I need to just bring out the file separately. No, it allows me to share the terminal, but not a single file. That's okay. So I need to share. This terminal. We can see the presentation now, Liran. Okay, so I just need to make full screen, I guess. Is that uh, work? Is it working right Perfect. Side? Okay. Should I get started? By all means. Okay, so um, uh, this picture of Peter uh, is, was taken when he was showing me around of uh, you know the attendant office and his neighborhood a few years ago. And uh, since I started working with Peter pretty much uh, right after I came out of school, so all my work related to options in particular have uh, the touch of uh, Peter and uh, you know, inputs from Peter's discussions, whether he's a co-author or not. And uh, in today's presentation, I'll do a quick summary of what we have been doing, what we have done, and also some new work, and even a new work, you know, obviously it's based on our historical work. In fact, uh, uh, just it's because of this uh, conference, it just pushed me to finally uh, take it up to, uh, and uh, try to write it up, do some research. So the past couple of weeks, I've been working on it very hard to get the data and get some good results. Uh, 
teacher would be happy to see the treatments. So why is 2H? Okay. So I'm thinking of option pricing from you know a bottom-up and top-down sort of classification. And uh, in my mind, the so-called bottom-up uh, approach of derivative pricing is very much analogous to classic uh, physics. It's probably like the Western science in general, the way of thinking. But you start by identifying the smallest common denominator in physics, that's the smallest particle you can get. And in option pricing, we either represent the common denominator in terms of the risk neutral dynamics of the underlying security, or the pricing of error the blue securities. Or I think Dilip worked with Peter on something, they use characteristic function as the spanning instruments. Right? And then once you have the common denominator, you just construct everything up uh, from uh, bottom up from the common denominator. Right? You either take expectation of future payoff on the same dynamics, or you price the payoffs as a basket of the spanning instruments, applies for the characteristic function, then you apply for a transform as a sort of uh, construction. And uh, one of the benefits of this approach is it offers uh, cross-section consistency because you have a common denominator. It acts as a single yardstick. It's almost like a pricing menu. Everything's priced based on the same menu. They are consistent with each other, right? So in that sense, even if the yardstick is wrong, that is your pricing menu is irrational, let's say, or something, at least the values remain consistent with one another, right? If they're too high, then they're consistently high in that sense, right? And uh, for many years, we, Peter and I worked together and we come up with this process called time change to levy process. Originally, Peter, when I was discussing it, he was thinking of it as, you know, data sometimes can complete the market. Instruments can complete the market. When instruments cannot complete the market, you can use model to complete the market. And this becomes sort of a machine to generate all kinds of models to help complete the market. And over the years, I'm more thinking of it from a, sort of engineering pro, uh, perspective, thinking of it as a Lego, like construction parts, right? You can use it to assemble, integrate different parts for model design. We can think of each source of shock or the innovation, we model it using something called a levy process. Essentially, it captures ID shock. But you say, no, 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 the shock varies over time, the intensity varies over time, or its impact on the security of model varies over time. Then we can capture that, uh, so the gas intensity using the time change uh, is pretty much analogous to stochastic um, volatility variance or stochastic arrival, arrival rate of jumps. So for me, it's just a convenient re-representation to make things a little bit easier, make it level like right, without writing the integral equations. I'm not good at math, so I want to make it uh, a little bit uh, cookie cutting. Right? And in this approach, you can sort of indulge in the ambition of a classic quant to build a model of everything, right? Think of your trying to model, then it's just a sort of a collection of parts, right? Identify the sources of risk, apply time change to capture time variation in these impacts and put them together, right? The key premise of this approach is that everything's related, right? Once you find the common denominator, you can build the whole world up that way. And uh, what you can use this approach to, uh, is to identify linkages and consolidate information. Right? You pull different sources of information together through this linkage, you do information consolidation. Right? So you can extract information, understand how information transforms across these mechanisms. And uh, I have been mostly working on this by side and then identify uh, stellar opportunities. Right? It could be cross market or within the market. You identify quants uh, in, you try to identify and quantify linkages that people have not seen and try to identify pricing inconsistencies and then you do stellar trading on it. But uh, over the years, I've built many of these models, uh, both academic papers, we published many academic papers and also worked on this uh, in the site to do market making, uh, trading, and uh, also, you also see there are limits to these approaches, right? So the issue is that it's very difficult to get everything under one framework, right? There are links. Everything is linked, but the link sometimes is very weak, right? There are some examples. For example, pricing long-dated contracts require 
unrealistically long projections, and many of these uh, stationary assumptions imply that these long-run data contracts would not move much. In reality, they move a lot, right? So there is some uh, conflicts that we, it's very hard to capture in, a, in, in, one, in one model, okay? And uh, over the years, I also realized that it's not always desirable to chain bundle everything together, okay? And each contract has its unique universe with uh, uh, contributions. We talk about primary securities, derivative securities, you know, these things are redundant because they can be replicable. To me, every contract is primary. Right? They are contributing something for their existence. Right? So they're all, it's hard to say which one is the dog, which one is the tail. They're all wagging. Okay. So, so it's important to capture that unique feature of each contract. Okay. And the pooling is important for information extraction, but uh, it can be limiting for individual contract pricing, which may need domain expertise. In reality, none of the traders know everything or investors know everything. They normally have a expertise and work in their area, right? even in the options. Some people work on the short-term options, some people work on the long-term options. right? And uh, in, when the linkage is weak, actually linking them together may not be good. I mean, the, the potential harm of error contagion can be larger than the potential benefit of information consolidation, right? Because uh, if you cut the linkage, then the sort of error condition stop at a certain point. But if you do this super linking, even like exponential weighting, whatever, right? The linkage is small, it's tiny, but the error can still propagate to it. Right? And the, the biggest issue I find is that, uh, you know, some of these models I have uh, successfully applied to trading. But amazingly, they can generate very nice pricing errors for that are trading. But if I calculate the risk sensitivities based on this model, they don't work that well. So we resort to using still black shows exposure estimates for risk management. So essentially, there is a divergence or even disengagement between the so-called Q quants, the pricing quants, and the P quants, the risk management. Okay, so the Q quants generate pricing. They claim it just, they pro, uh, guarantees cross section consistency and the pricing errors within your limits and so on. But with little regard whether the estimated risk neutral dynamics has anything to do with actual time series variation. So as a result, for risk management for PNL attribution, most teams, most platforms use a completely separate framework. Maybe they do make do with. Uh, some simple metrics. It's not from a one model, right? For pricing maybe, but not for the risk management, okay? So if you think practically what investors do, right? Different investors tend to have different domain expertise. So they focus on different segments of markets. They don't need a model that links everything together. They need a model that lever what they're good at. Sense, right? They have what they don't know or work on what they know. So if they're not working on interest rates, their pricing and interest could be all wrong, but they don't even care. They don't need to forecast it. They only focus on things they interested. The other thing is that short-term investors do not care much about the terminal payoffs if you, or even its macro foundations. All she worries about is the PL for her particular investment on the short investment horizon. And even for long-term investors, you need to worry about your short-term TNL attribution. So the integration is useful, I guess, up to the payoffs. But what you're really worried is, what are the risks for tomorrow, right? If you can manage your risk well for tomorrow, one day at a time, then you'll be okay, right? And uh, based on these considerations, we have been working on a top-down perspective. I put the quotation mark here. I mean, Peter and I have been talking about this forever. Right? And he's still affecting our sort of my thinking along these directions. Right? So, so, so what's this top-down perspective? So the analysis wants to start from a particular contract. That's top-down. Bahama is starting from the common denominator. Here we are starting with one contract, right? And uh, it has a short-term focus. It's looking at more like the next day PNL variation, right? Risk without worrying about the terminal payoff yet. I mean, obviously the payoff may affect the risk exposure, right? But the main focus is the day per day movement, okay? And ideally, ideally uh, the, we can embed the statistical uh, forecasts into the pricing so that we can build a tight integration between the pricing and the risk management and the investment, okay? So that's sort of what we try 
as a ultimate goal. Okay. And uh, so the approach starts with a value representation. We call it top-down value representation. So <clears throat> we represent the value of a particular contract. We're focusing on one contract, no common dynamics, one contract. We represent its value using the Black Martin Schultz pricing formula. So essentially, you're using the formula not as a pricing model per se, but as a way of representing the major risk sources, right? So the way I write it, we're ignoring the contract details. I is the contract details. We're saying, okay, if I'm using this valuation uh, sort of pricing equation, we are implicitly thinking there are three sources of variation: time. Time is deterministic, but option contracts value goes down with you know, time, and uh, the underlying. Uh, security price and the options implied volatility. So, so the options all implied volatility as sort of a summary of all the other price movements about this contract, other than the price and, and time, right? So to make things easy uh, over the years, I have learned to do everything in the forward space so that I don't need to worry about rates, right? So these are options, equity options in particular, currency options. So we want to work on the equity, uh, forward space so that uh, you know whatever you look at is the excess. It just simplifies notation a, a little bit. And uh, finding a right representation, the top-down representation is very important, obviously, because you're using it to highlight the risk sources. If you use the representation that doesn't highlight the risk source correctly, then it's not going to work. So you can we can search for different representations for different contracts, right? And uh, for option contracts in particular, the black choice model is a popular choice. Uh, traders have been using it for quotes for risk management, right? They, they talk about Delta, Vega, they're using this as a risk management. But you can explore other representations as well. For example, even the Barshall year model, it could be a good representation, right? It's like slightly different, but the fact that it allows negative price is not much of an issue because it's just representing as a local, it's a local representation. Which one is better? I don't know. It's more up to the exploration, right? Given this representation, we do a short-term PNL attribution, and it's top-down because it's based on this contract specifically. Right? This contract has three uh, risk sources, so you just do a Taylor expansion, right? Or against time, or against the price movement, or against the, its own implied ball, right? First order, second order, and uh, if you say uh, this security price and implied ball are going to be moving diffusively over the next step, dt, then I don't really care about the future. Maybe there are random jumps in the future. As long as you don't have random jumps in the next step, you do not expect to have random jumps in the next uh, instant, then the second order would be fine. That's the math, right? But suppose you think there could be random price jumps then in principle, you can keep the Taylor expansion. Right? I'm not thinking of it as the Ethel Lama, more thinking of a Taylor expansion, right? a simpler math. Just then you do a, maybe the third order, fourth order expansion on, on, on price to capture the price jump. Okay. But uh, in this uh, presentation, I just focus on the second order and see how it works. Okay. So then you apply no arbitrage, right? You do this piano allocation, you apply the no arbitrage condition. Uh, which says that these are all forward change, right? So that's a excess PNL we invest in. And uh, then the risk neutral expectation of the risk, uh, risk neutral expectation of the excess PNL should be zero, right? I just uh, analyze it to make the number look a little bit nicer. So the, this right hand side is just taking expectation of these terms, right? DT is gone. So that's the expectation of the uh, vol change. That's the expectation of the a price a squared price change, expectation of vol change squared, and expectation of their uh, co movements in a sense, right? So this equation, if you set it to zero, looks pretty much like a partial differential equation, right? It's very similar to those PDEs in a bottom up model, except for a bottom up model, you don't know the functional form of the valuation functional form. So you try to do an integration of the PDE subject to boundary conditions to solve for the functional form. Here, we start with a known uh, uh, representation. We know the functional form, so we know the derivatives, right? So it's for a given contract, so it's not integrating. It's just it as is. So essentially, this becomes a price equation. All it says is that uh, uh, for the price to include no dynamic arbitrage, it has to satisfy this uh, equation, which says the risk-neutral expected uh, PNL 
XSKNL has to be zero. Okay. So time decay lowers the expected uh, PNL, but you're hoping the other terms give you some kind of expected again to balance them out. And that's what is formally done. The question is, how do you apply this pricing relation? Is it top-down pricing relation for each single contract, right? The issue is identification because this is a pricing equation for one contract, but uh, we have uh, expectations of variance. And also for each contract, you have this expected law change, its own law variance, its uh, law covariance with the security return. You have three risk neutral moment conditions, right? So you cannot identify three moment conditions based on one price. Right? So for identification, we need some sort of pooling in order to get it work, okay? So the first effort we did is uh, a JV paper in 2016. Right? There we assume common risk neutral dynamics on the implied law surface. Okay? By assuming common unit dynamics, we link them together. Actually at that time, we were not even thinking of these as a top-down pricing formula. We were still thinking of it as a bottom-up pricing. Peter always starts with saying that, okay, I have a underlying stock, a bond. Now I need one basis contract, option contract as a basis, using these three contract, I span the whole world, make it complete. Then we're specifying that the whole valve surface is driven by one single Brownian risk, right? It's, you assume sort of like par parallel moving, right? Only until later, probably right after or right around uh, the paper is published, I realized that it doesn't de depend on a basis contract, right? So this is just a simple moment of conditions. There's no arbitrage condition is per contract. It's just saying that the risk neutral re, uh, excess return should be zero. That's that. That's it, right? So it doesn't need to be DZ. It could be DZ. I, everyone can has its own. All you are, all we are assuming, or all we need to assume is that uh, these moments are somehow linked, right? So all matters is, okay, the mean is the same, the variance is the same, and the covariance is the same. In the paper, actually, we add some term structure pattern because we find this doesn't work. Uh, the longer term contract do not move as much. So we as some trying to find some exponential or function to sort of uh, accommodate the term structure pattern, right? So, so the first effort actually, we didn't start with top down. It's still sort of a uh, bottom mentality. Essentially, Peter bumped into this more like a mathematical endeavor, okay? But over time we realized it's really a single contract specific pricing relation. So we worked on it more. And in this Jeff paper in 2020, we sort of tried to elaborate this decentralized pricing sort of perspective. But then how do we do identification? So the idea is that yes, all contracts are priced by itself. Each contract is unique and different, but, but nearby contracts, is, I know it's a very vague term, but uh, it's a common sense term. It's not a mathematical term, right? Nearby contracts are similar. I mean, if you have an option at a one year, another one year, $100 strike, another contract at one year, $101 strike, they're so close. Their payoff is similar. Their movement has to be similar, by, almost by construction, okay? Forget about the underlying whatever dynamics. They have to be similar because the contracts are similar. So if they're similar, they share similar risks, they should move similar. And all we need is the moment condition. So we're just assuming that the moment conditions of nearby contracts are close to each other. So we can all apply some sort of a local smoothing. Right here, I show you a graph is sort of trying to statistically using empirical evidence to show that nearby contracts move together. Right? So these are the distance of contracts with probably with the one month, uh, with the add money option. Right? It says that uh, if you're very close to add the money, the distance is zero, then your correlation is very high. At the same maturity, that is 100% by design, right? So at the distance, the money increases, the correlation goes down, right? So, and these are across different maturities. When you are at different maturities, the correlation also drops, right? I think the bottom, okay, the center is three months. So the distance, one month and three months, the distance, that three months actually is large because short-term information propagates very fast. So the, the correlation goes down faster, right? In the longer maturity, it goes down slower. But the bottom line is this is not an exact mathematical representation. It's more like a common sense, a trader choice. Trader knows that the Black-Scholes model is limited, but they also know that similar contracts are similar. 
so they can intuitively buy one contract, sell the near, nearby contract without even worrying about the, the ratios. The ratio is close to one, right? Forget about these risk exposure, just put them together. The risk will be small, right? So this is really about that. So the whole paper is stressing about contract choice, whether you're for, being butterflies or forming something, uh, you try to choose nearby contracts and it's safe. Okay. Even if you're, you don't need to do much calculation, you don't need a model assumption. That's what we did there. Okay. So now, what do we do after this? Okay. So here I quote uh, the Romans of Three Kingdoms. It says that here begins our tale, the empire long divided must unite, long united must divide. Now we start with bottom up pricing to try to link everything together. Here. Then we said, no, linking everything together is too binding. I won't break things down. So we get this top down pricing relation, which is decentralized to each contract, freedom, right? Uh, consistency is not a big deal. We want to be unique. And for this top down pricing, we argue that the pricing of each contract should be proportional to its own risk, right? So there's no relation to others, or you don't need to link them to others. You just need to be proportional to your own risk. But what we realize is that this proportionality coefficients itself, you said pricing of each contract is proportional to its own risk. But there's that proportionality, that proportionality coefficients themselves can be the new common denominator that unite all contracts. So if we talk about market pricing, market clearing or supply demand trading on one single contract, it determines the price of that contract. Right? And if you do statistical R on similar contracts or related contracts, then that statistical arbitrage forces them. I'm not even talking about mathematical no arbitrage. Right? These are just statistically, if something similar, they should be priced similar. That's all I'm saying. Right? Then they should have similar proportional uh, pricing, right? One apple is worth $1, then two apples should be worth about $2. Maybe their size, color, whatever, differ a little bit, right? Similar proportional pricing. And in this new framework, we are trying to do effort, we're trying to do is that we're trying to unite the decentralized pricing of all contracts by assuming some common pricing structure or same or similar risks, right? They're not exactly the same because these are decentralized pricing. But we can categorize them, we'll categorize them and try to see if we can put the similar category risk as this similar risk and assume the proportionality should be this. Okay. So the step would be we forecast the statistic movement conditions of each contract based on historical movements. Right? This Black Shoes representation is very nice because it's not in terms of some hidden states, instantaneous variance or economic factors. It's in terms of observable quantities, the, start, the security price movement the contracts own implied volatility, you see all of these because they are observable. You can easily measure their historical mean, historical variance or covariance. That's what our forecast of moment conditions are going to be based on. Then they'll assume some common proportional pricing structure across all contracts. Then using some sort of a cross-sectional regression, you can identify this common price, okay? So I'm currently working on this with uh, Yu Zhao Jiang, a young researcher. Actually, Peter introduced me to him during, I think, uh, during the pandemic somewhere, they were trying different versions of these regressions on this top-down pricing model, and uh, they get me involved. So we are going to carry forward and uh, continue this research. Once. So this is the model I propose, a linear, I call it linear cross-sectional option pricing model. On the right-hand side, I put uh, the negative time decay for each contract, I, right? On the right-hand side, you have the standard exposures, uh, Vega, Gamma, uh, Volga, and uh, this is the Vanna exposure, right? So in the original pricing equation, in front of them are the risk neutral moment of each exposure, right? This will be the risk neutral mean, risk neutral variance, risk neutral variance of the implied law, and risk neutral covariance. So here I'm trying to specify in a way where we can single out the market pricing. So how do we model the risk neutral mean? Uh, right. We said, okay, risk neutral mean should be proportional to uh, the risk, right? So each contract has different risks. So we estimate the variance of each implied amount separately, but uh, they might have similar market pricing of each unit of low risk. So that captures the market pricing of low risk, variance risk in a sense, implied low risk. So this is similar risk, right? Because this is implied about for one contract and that implied about for another contract, they're not exactly the same, but we'll assume they're similar. So we'll apply similar pricing coefficients. And this is more like a forecast 
of their statistical drift down the road. We have a historical estimate. We don't know whether the company's future will be proportional to the historical one or inverse to the historical one. And we, through the regression, we use the market to determine the, uh, the forecast. If it's positive, that means market is pricing momentum. And if it's negative, it means market is pricing reverse. Okay. And uh, here, since we already put in the uh, historical return variance, this is more like a pricing adjustment, either reflects risk premium. I know under certain diffusion models, the return variance should be the same under the two measures, but uh, maybe when there are jumps, there will be difference, or when there's mispricing, right? You think your estimate is 10%, maybe the market think is 11%, then this will be greater than one. So that minus one can be a percentage deviation of pricing of risk or mispricing or something. Okay? Same thing for the variance of the implied variance, and for covariance, it's a little bit trickier because if the historical covariance estimate is zero, I cannot apply a proportional coefficient anymore, right? So what I did is uh, apply the product of these various terms and directly estimate a single risk neutral co correlation, and then compare the single risk neutral correlation with the average uh, statistical correlation as a market pricing estimate or a mispricing pricing estimate, whatever is driving that. So essentially this model decomposes contribution of each risk source into these three components, risk exposure times risk magnitude, both are contract specific, then times some common market price, right? Risk exposure can be readily very easy to calculate. Risk magnitude can be forecasted using historical data. And the common uh, pricing is obtained through this cross-sectional regression. And the pricing error represents mispricing in a sense, right? An overpriced contract will have faster decay, so the pricing error will be positive. So if you look at this uh, time decay, so it has this dependence on implied variance. So if I divide it by dollar, gamma, and times above, I roughly convert the pricing error in the theta decay space, time decay space, into the implied law space. Okay? So this regression, you can cross-sectional, right? It's similar to the Farman West regression of forecasting returns. Instead, instead of forecasting future returns in the cross-sectional regression, we directly do a contemporaneous regression of price, right? And uh, the forecasting regression has R squared probably less than one. Here, the R squared should be 90% or higher. So it has a stronger identification. That means our identification of the risk premiums could also be more robust. Right? And in a sense, it's also related to this so-called implied cost of cost, cost, liter cost of capital literature, where you forecast future cash flows, apply this kind of cash, uh, cash flow model to value a stock. You equal the stock value to price, you imply the discount rate, right? Here, we're essentially implying the market price of risk, in a sense. If you also put in cash flow forecast and uh, the risk forecast, I guess it's a little bit easier for option contracts. So we can come up with this linear structure instead of this complex DCF sort of structure. Mm -hmm. So application, you can apply to stocks, uh, currencies. We have done a couple of periods on the stock index. So here, I want to try the currencies. Uh, we the many currency pairs. We then try to get the presentation going, pick two pairs with the longest history from 1996 to last week. Last week, I downloaded the data. Five data from 10 data to 90 data, five maturities from one month to 12 months. There are longer dated options. There's also one week options. They are a little bit noisier. So for this version in particular, I just exclude them. So for the implementation first, to calculate this vol change, we need to do fixed contract chain instead of floating series. So we need to do some interpolation to generate that. And then for the moment conditions, as I said, since the vol surface should be smooth, this variance covariance should be smooth as well. So we apply some sort of like cross-section smoothing to reduce errors because this is a regression, right? If the estimation errors are large here, I don't know, it may affect the R square, but that's the small thing. It will bias the estimates of the risk premiums. And that's crucial. So we need to find ways to reduce the estimation error because otherwise uh, error invariable problem will be big, right? We construct historical estimators at one month, one quarter, and one year. Uh, so you, in principle, you can do a forecast simulation. Now I'm saying, let's use the market to, to tell me which one is the appropriate horizon at each date. So at each date, we run the cross regression with one set of estimator and pick the set of estimators with the highest R square. That means at that date, the market is using that horizon as an estimator, okay? Most days we can just run simple list square regression, but in some days, some of the identification becomes a little bit wild. 
these parameters do not make sense anymore. They can go negative, right? These are the variance of uh, return and variance of implied ball. And this is the risk uh, correlation. So I feel like they should be greater than zero and correlation should be within one in absolute magnitude. Whether you constrain it or not constraining it, it doesn't affect the overall results, but it just look ugly, right? So I put constraints on them when they are valid. It's about less than 10% of the sample, I guess. 10, let me think, 400, 6,000. Yes, less than maybe 5%. That's the average implied vowel surface. For the yin, it's a little bit darker sloping than average. For pound, is a bit no, uh, positive skewed. Pound is a bit uh, negative skewed. They all have somewhat upper sloping term structure. Okay. So that's my uh, our implied vowel variance estimation. Right? So the five lines are across five delta. Well, I'm plotting them against the maturity. You can see that the variance of the implied vowel movements are coming down with maturities. But across delta, they are very similar. And this term structure pattern directly affects the contribution uh, or the Vega contribution through here, right? And the Volga contribution, as well as the Vena contribution. So essentially, we directly embed a cross sectional term structure pattern without a functional form, right? We use the empirical term structure pattern, but we don't need to specify some function to accommodate it anymore. These are R squares, very close to 100%. The median R square is. 99.6, 99.7%, right? The minimum is over 90%. So these are extremely high R squares on the CFD case space. The model fits superbly well. So these are the mean absolute pricing errors. So I divide them by the error by dollar gamma and the vol to convert them into implied vol. So the mean absolute error is larger for long dated out of money options. And due to our theta, they have smaller theta contribution, right? Uh, so smaller weighting in a sense. The shorter term add money has higher weighting and uh, the, the error is smaller. The grand average is about 23 basis points and 16 basis point for pound. This is, I did a copy of my earlier paper called uh, the guest steel paper. There I'm just a ballpark uh, eyeballing their estimation error. The, for the base model is about 70 basis point for yen, 30 for, uh, for pound. For the stochastic skew model, is a little bit better, 60 basis point, 20 basis point for, uh, for pound. So it's all this simple linear model is generally much smaller error. I know the sample is not comparable, but that the error is small. Right? And uh, okay. So these are the time series reg cross section regression coefficients, right? Which I convert them into so called market pricing. Right, so this is the Vega market price of Vega risk, mostly positive. That means on average, I have an upward term, upward sloping term structure, right? Because it's mostly positive, but they can switch signs. Volga is, this is also positive, which means the historical vol of the implied vol estimate is smaller than the risk neutral one. The smile is deeper relative to the historical vol estimate, okay? But gamma is close to, the bias is close to zero. You call it pricing or bias close to zero, which means risk neutral variance for the currency pairs and historical return variance, they are similar, the variance, right? Vanna is basically comparing risk neutral skew with historical skew. For yen is mostly positive, for pound is mostly negative. So the his historical estimate varies around zero. These persistent variations mostly show the persistent variation of the skew. So this linear structure makes it very simple to create option portfolios, right? to either hash the risk closure or target exposure, right? So we can build this matrix and by six, all these exposures, I adjust them by not only the Vanna, Volga, Vega risk, but also by their historical uh, risk estimates because each contract has different risks. So you, I want to rebalance them. So I call them risk adjusted exposure. And then you can easily form a like minimize variance subject to some target risk exposure, you come up with a portfolio, very much like a regression, right? Suppose I want to do statistical arbitrage, I just set the target to zero, except the target to the error, to negative one, right? So that means I'm constructing a portfolio that's neutral to all risk exposures, but short one unit exposure to the pricing error, right? That's essentially you're doing step up. Or I can target any specific exposure to one and zero otherwise that's a risk targeting portfolio, or you call it factor portfolio. Okay. So for stat arc, so these are the cumulative paths of the uh, stat arc. I either do constant risk every day or fixed notional to every normalization. Uh, under constant risk, uh, 
pound options makes more money per unit error, okay? But under fixed notion though, the error is larger for yen, so yen makes a little bit more, but uh, they are sharp uh, from this normalization are uh, very much similar. It's just uh, the relative scale changes a little bit, okay? So now these are set up on the pricing errors. It says the pricing error are highly reverting. Now let's look at uh, the, uh, the pricing estimate and the portfolio risk portfolio, targeting portfolio returns in the future, right? This is a forecasting relation, more like a verification. Amazingly, I didn't expect it. Amazingly, each market pricing risk forecasts positively their future risk targeting portfolio return, right? The, the circle is where the zero is. Zero risk, zero return. Zero risk, zero return, right? So they're all positive and a very little bias, except the gamma portfolio seems like we have some bias either due to specification or estimation, right? The gamma portfolio tends to be more negative than the estimates suggests. But overall, this is amazing. Essentially, the statistical moment conditions we add, it's not only allow us to sort of unite the decentralized pricing across different countries, but it's also creating a unique, useful anchors or bridges for us to identify the market pricing of each source of risk. Right. Whether it works or not, this is more like exposed to verification. Right? If you do a pharma magnetic regression, you are trying to identify some risk premium right? through a forecasting regression. That's hard. Here, the risk premium is ex anti identified from violation. This is more like exposed verification. Does it work? Roughly, it works pretty well over most of these risk sources. So we can do auto sample simple auto sample market uh, timing without running predictive regressions. Right? All we need to do is for each risk targeting portfolio, set the weight proportion to the market pricing. If the market pricing is highly positive, short the contract, make the premium. If it's negative, long it. Right? That's all we do with some normalization to make them comparable. So these are the uh, investment return behaviors, fixed risk, right? You just constantly short a unit of that risk targeting portfolio and do market timing. Through market timing, look at this information ratio. They're pretty good. At least they're all positive. So without knowing ex ante whether the risk premium should be positive or negative, they're all positive, right? So here, if you just short Volga because the smile is very thick relative to historical moments, you too make money, right? For both cases. In other cases, gamma, you lose money because the vol is lower. But ex ante say we don't know this, right? But it's fine. As long as you just target the portfolio based on your cross-sectional regression, it's all of somewhere, right? You do a cross-sectional regression based on collections, you do longer, shorter of your target getting portfolio. And you can make money on all of them. Better when your relation is stronger, weaker for gamma is weaker because our linkage is somewhat uh, weaker, right? But all of them are positive. Right? So that's it, right? So classic option pricing starts with the, some underlying risk neutral dynamic specification and try to integrate a PDF, PDE, or PID to obtain a valuation. And the, the biggest concern for me is that uh, the estimated risk neutral dynamics is often disintegrated from the actual movements of the underlying price, right? So that, you know, pricing and the risk management, they have to rely on separate frameworks. So here, based on my past works with Peter, we are continuing that path, but uh, we come up with extremely simple, but very well performing linear option pricing model. The linear structure is very nice, straightforward for you to construct portfolios to hedge or target exposure. And the cross-sectional regression estimate directly tells you the pricing of that sort of risk, whether it's overpriced, underpriced relative to the middle point. Historically, we try to estimate something called a break-even value for the option contract. But what we do here essentially is breaking down the breaking even value of a contract into break even contributions of each risk source. And we can trade on each risk source separately. So if you think about you know, what constitutes a good model, you know this, you said, okay, pricing error has to be small. German said, okay, all the big cons are a big interpolator. That's useful. You're essentially performing smooth interpolation. But another use of it is you want the error to be mean reverting if you're doing set up trading, right? Actually, if the error are highly mean reverting, then error being small, maybe not the requirement anymore. You want large error, which means large activity, a large opportunity, right? But the harder thing is to make sure that your model is not a cubic plan and if you're assuming the dynamics have some resemblance of the actual movement. That's not easy, right? 
I mean, a dumb process can generate a smile. Is the guest of all can generate a smile? Which is the real process, right? So you assume the process ideally have some resemblance of the actual moment. And more importantly, they can de deviate. But when they deviate, the deviation should predict future ret uh, returns of targeting portfolio. That deviation could be what we call the market pricing risk, an equilibrium model, rational pricing. But it could be some e disequilibrium, irrational market mispricing. Either way is fine, right? It's a mispricing, we can trade on it too. If it's pricing, well, we can make a premium. If it's mispricing, we can make good money. Either way is fine. For future work, I mean, this is very preliminary. Obviously, you can, lots of things you can work on, right? You can try different markets. For example, the setup is very, setup is very general, kind of applied to different asset classes and even different uh, derivative contracts. Because as long as you can calculate the exposures, estimate the moments, you're fine, right? But uh, I guess the details, you know, the devils are in the details. How do you specify the market pricing to, to be able to extract something that's useful? Maybe we should go back to the economic theory to understand what are the economic drivers of the pricings and variations. Maybe that will help us to understand how to specify this, uh, you know, different components of the market pricing. And uh, again, forecasting these moments is important to embed them into the pricing equation. But in order to embed them into the pricing equation as an anchor, uh, they are better accurate in some sense, right? If your estimation error is large, my regression will be biased. If they're biased, then my estimates will also be biased, right? So how do you reduce the error? Here I said, there are at least three or four so th sources of information you can use, historical and pricing, right? Pricing give you an expectation of the uh, future, so it's useful. And the, the surface, you do some cross-section smoothing, maybe other information. So in order for them to be a good anchor, right? We are saying we're using them as an anchor to generate pricing linkage between the pricing and the, 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 real, the, the real world, right? But in order for them to be a good anchor, it's important to generate uh, accurate statistical forecasts. And that's it, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tony Corso. Uh, I was going to ask something about whether you could use this to price swaps versus caplets. And then I realized I haven't traded interest rates since 1988. So something a little different. Um, oil is the sum of gasoline and heating oil, sum of gasoline and diesel. Um, how would you handle seasonality? On the, on the heating oil part versus gasoline part, which is to say um, it's cold in January and the following December. So the volatility of heating oil is high, not so cold in, in June, volatility is low. Opposite for gas, people don't drive in January or December. Um, people do a lot of driving in July. So there's a seasonality to that volatility that you're trying to tie back to the crude oil volatility, and how would you handle that? Very good question. I think this framework is perfect for that. Because if you think about it, if we just do risk neutral dynamic specification and trying to price these contracts over different her, uh, maturities, then the seasonality is sort of important. And it, you find it very hard to specify the seasonality pattern in a functional form, at least a smooth functional form, right? It's just there, right? It's a calendar, a, almost like a calendar effect. But I think since we're embedding statistical moment forecasts, you can adjust for seasonality directly in your historical uh, uh, moment forecasts. Just like our his term structure of implied vol is declining, it could be zigzag even, right? You've, because of seasonality, they are zigzag, you just embed them, right? So essentially you are automatically, automatically adjusting for seasonality or whatever you observe about their moments first. And all you're assuming is that given that seasonality, given that actual observed historical movements, what's the proportional pricing? So in my first paper with Peter, when we try to specify the term structure pattern, we struggle a lot. Right? So how do you do it? Exponential decay or slower decay? Sometimes it doesn't decay, right? Here, I don't care. Uh, just look at the data. If they're decaying, decaying. If, they are, if the vol is going up, say longer term contracts actually, the implied law actually moves more, fine, right? 
just let them move more because the, the driver of the term structure are our historical estimates. The only caveat is you said, okay, historically they tend to go up, but tomorrow it'll be going down. That's at least that's your forecast, then it won't work, right? Then when you do the price and you may get some sort of a negative conditions or something trying to reverse back in your forecast. All right, very good. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to, um, going from this point forward, we'll move the schedule back 15 minutes in case anyone needs to plan minor adjustments to your schedules. Um, but we're going to uh, allow the speakers their full time to speak in all cases, okay? Um, and our next speaker, uh, we uh, Rosa Galeva, representing NYU Tandon. Get your presentation up there shortly. Title of her presentation will be Deriving Better Derivatives. 